Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Kayla Roth. I'll be your host for today's event. We have a great discussion planned today on preparing today's workforce for tomorrow. I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Erica Tetuan and Keith Keating. As change management practice lead, Erica Tetuan provides thought leadership, introduces leading edge models, methods, experiences, and practices to ensure clients achieve their desired goals and outcomes. She has 20 years of experience in influencing stakeholders and working collaboratively to motivate diverse groups of people to achieve common goals. She has developed change management methodologies, built internal change management practices, and led strategic organizational transformations. Keith Keating joins us with a career spanning over 20 years in learning and development, and he's currently pursuing his doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania's Chief Learning Officer Program. He has experience in a myriad of areas ranging from instructional design, leadership coaching, and performance improvement and process. Keith has been leading clients on the design, development, and execution of their global learning strategies and applying human-centered design to solve challenges for learners, including helping them to prepare the workforce of the future. Now that we've got to know you both a little bit better, Keith, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Kayla, and welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining and taking time out of your busy day. Eric and I have a lot of information that we're excited to be sharing with you today. Now, let me just start by sharing with you that I am particularly passionate about the topic of preparing our workforce for the future and this phenomenon that we're calling the future of work. In fact, it's my body of study in my doctoral research at the University of Pennsylvania's Chief Learning Officer Program. And so with that, when we think about the workforce of the future, one of the first challenges that we have is that people don't know what opportunities will be available to them. They don't know what else they can be because they don't know what's going to exist or what type of skills are going to be required in the age of automation. And our workforce is worried. In fact, right now, it's estimated that 40% of our workforce are worried about the future of their jobs as a result of automation and robotics. 40%. And then if we just go out and do a quick search on the internet, it helps to really fuel this fear by planting seeds that make us wonder, will robots take our children's jobs? And then we've got estimates thrown out such as automation could kill 73 million US jobs by 2030. And then prophecies like robots may steal as many as 800 million jobs in the next 13 years. And then my favorite by far, you will lose your job to a robot and sooner than you think. These headlines are scary. Now, I'd be scared too if I didn't understand the context that's behind them. And then if you dig a little bit deeper, you're going to come across other statistics like that of McKinsey and Company that estimates 30 million jobs in the U.S. may be at risk as a result of automation and robotics. Digging even further, PwC estimates that it could be 38 million jobs at risk, but then the Organization for Economic Development estimates that mm, it's only 9 million, and then Forrester Research suggests that it's actually 24 million, and Science Alert Magazine says, no, it's only 3 million. And then Oxford University Research rounds off our list with 47 million people estimated to be impacted. So what does all of this tell us? We don't know. We simply don't know how big or small the impact will be to our workforce, but whether it's 3 million or 30 million, people will be impacted. And it's our job as learning and development leaders to help them be prepared. So what can we do? The answer is we can start by focusing on what we do know. And what we do know is that these types of global changes they're not new. We know that technology has been changing for at least eight centuries since the horse collar became universal throughout Europe in the early 12th century. And technology reached a new stage with the Industrial Revolution starting in the 19th century. And roughly once a generation since then, we've got people in a near panic because technology is destroying jobs. But if we look back at the agriculture or the manufacture changes in the 19th century, although yes, they did decline, the rest of the economy continued to grow. And so if history is any indicator, with these new changes, our economy will also continue to grow. And it is true that new technology, 
often does destroy existing jobs. But that's not the end of the story. What we do know is that new technology also creates new jobs. Let's think about the introduction of the automobile in the early 20th century. So before automobiles, we had carriages and the horses that pulled them. Enter the automobile, and it absolutely destroys that industry. There's a lot of jobs that were lost as a result of this new technology, eventually all of the jobs. But automobiles also created new jobs. And they created change, like changing the streetcar to buses, creating new jobs like gas station attendants and auto repair workers and new industries like the ability to vacation, the ability to live further away from work by creating travel or even creating new towns and new cities. Maybe a little more recent in our lifetime, an example of this type of change is the introduction of new technology, the personal computer. So with the personal computer, yes, about three and a half million jobs were destroyed, but over 19 million jobs and counting were created. So that's an initial surplus of over 15 million jobs. And many of the jobs that were created by technology and personal computers are ones that you couldn't have even imagined existing before that technology, like a professional video game player or a social media influencer or a YouTube cat video analyzer, all which are real jobs. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, none of those jobs were on that list of what I want to be when I grow up, but they're there today because they didn't exist back then, but kids nowadays are aspiring to be in one of these roles. And so what do we know? We know that there is work being done to help identify areas that are gonna be impacted by automation. So research firms like McKinsey and Company have been analyzing more than 2,000 work activities across more than 800 occupations to help identify which one of those work activities can be automated. Now, what they've come up with is a number of activities that we will see a reduction through automation. Now, what's important to recognize here is that a reduction in hours in automatable tasks gives us the opportunity to use that time and to apply our expertise, our human skills, which may result in an increase in productivity in those same areas because it gets rid of those mundane tasks that we don't want to or need to be doing because technology and automation can be doing them for us. But here's the important part. We need to recognize the activities where the net loss of hours is greater than the net gain. Basically, where technology and automatable tasks are better than we are. They do those tasks better. And what we do know is that there are three areas that have the highest potential for automation. Collecting data, processing data, and predictable physical activities. Automation does it better. So we take this information and we map those activities across occupations and what we identify are two categories. Jobs with the highest probability of demand increase like teachers, lawyers, engineers, and jobs with the highest probability of demand decrease, like retail sales, laborers, logistics, vehicle operators. And this is where we need to pay special attention because currently in the US, we have over 25 million people employed in just those five job categories where we're going to see a significant future demand decrease. So McKinsey may not be too far off after all with their estimation of 25, 30 million people being at risk. Now, while it might seem like automation is something that's not gonna impact us until tomorrow, far off in the future, the reality is it's happening today and in areas that you may be able to recognize. Like for example, we've got customer service agents who are being replaced by chatbots and IBM's Watson. You've got logistics or warehouse forklift drivers who are being replaced by robots. 
You no longer have to go into a bank to deposit a check, which I personally absolutely love. I was just teaching my father how to use it this weekend. But as a result, we're going and are seeing a reduction in financial services clerks. So what do we know? We know that there will be jobs lost. Like we're seeing today, it could be as great as 15% globally, but we also know that jobs will be changed. As we work side by side with technology, with automation, our jobs will be changed, allowing us to be more productive. And more importantly, as history shows us, we do know that jobs will be gained, including new jobs that we can't even fathom existing today. And the jobs gained could be as great as 20 to 30 percent, significantly offsetting those that are lost, much like we've seen with automobiles and computers. But we don't hear about those statistics. We don't hear about the hopeful side of automation because fear sells. Clickbait works. It's there for a reason. And that's where we need to step in as HR and learning and development leaders because planning and action drive change and create the future. And we can do this together. We have the opportunity to help prepare the workforce of the future today. So we do this by starting to look at ourselves and identifying how we, learning and development, need to evolve. Today, we're known as encouraging on-the-job learning, teaching knowledge, producing content, producing job-related content. We're known as the providers of learning. In fact, I've even heard some people refer to us as the owners of learning. That's a lot of accountability and responsibility on our shoulders. I don't want to be the owner of learning for others. So what if we flip that? What if instead of being the providers of learning, we became learning enablers? And we created connected learners by empowering and enabling them to take control over their future. And so we do this by focusing on skills instead of jobs. We identify the skills that our learners have today, and we identify the skills that they need tomorrow. And then we architect developmental opportunities to bridge that gap, all the while giving our learners the opportunities to develop those skills while we're teaching them how to learn properly through building effective learning habits. Creating the connected learner is how we can prepare today's workforce for tomorrow. So I want to drill down into those three areas, but I want to start first by taking a deeper look at skills and starting with the skill difference between artificial intelligence and our own. If we look at AI, AI excels in a lot of areas. In fact, AI excels in linear and repetitive tasks. But we excel in creative. AI is strong in problem identification. And that's okay because we're stronger in solving complex problems. AI provides information. We find meaning in that information. And in the future, AI will lead the machine industries. And that's okay because we're going to be leading the people. And although robots may be coming more human-like and Hollywood and the media might like us to believe that someday they could replace us, the reality is robots are not human and they cannot become human. And so we need to focus on the skills that separate artificial intelligence from our own. The skills that make us human are higher order cognitive skills. It's those skills that give us the ability to connect with our patients, our customers, our learners, through empathy and interpersonal skills, or our complex problem solving skills that go beyond the linear as robots do and stop. 
our creativity, our originality, our emotion, our logic. These are the skills of the future, our human skills. And so we need to start today by having conversations with our talent. And we need to help them identify their current cognitive skill set. Now, one tool that we can use is a skills barometer that helps us capture and chart the skills that they have today, while we also identify the skills that they're interested in developing further. And then we can turn this into a heat map to help us identify the skill gaps within our organizations and identify where it is that we need to be focusing on. And then we can turn that into short-term development plans. Another output of identifying our current skills is helping our employees uncover what we call transferable skills. Now, for me, this is one of the most important concepts for me to grasp early in my career, helping me overcome my fear about the future, about the valuable skills that I have, and being able to ensure that I have a job no matter where I go. Transferable skills are a core set of skills and ability that can transfer to a whole host of other opportunities. Sometimes we call those portable skills. For me, regardless of my functional job title, what I am is a problem solver. At the heart of everything I do and the passion that I have is around solving problems. And that transfers to any organization, any job, any customer, any industry. That's my key transferable skill. So when we have a workforce that's worried about the future, what better way to motivate our team than to help them recognize their transferable skills? So after identifying their current skill sets, helping them understand the concept of transferable skills, we then need to focus on future skills. And we start by capturing ongoing market data to help us predict and prepare for those emerging skill needs. Now, an easy, accessible way for you to start learning today about those trends, about the future, is research that's already available today from reputable firms like the World Economic Forum, Forrester, Burson, McKinsey Global Institute. This information exists right now, and it's our responsibility as leaders, HR, learning and development, that we should be curators of this information. We should be reviewing, distilling down, understanding what these future skill needs are so that we can help our workforce prepare. So go out and start researching this information today. Now, while external research is very valuable, so is internal research. And one of the most important opportunities for future insight is directly through your own business, your own customers, gathering their input on future skill needs, asking them important questions. What gaps do they see? What are their strategies for the near future? How is their business evolving? How is the industry evolving? What do the disruptors look like? And most importantly, how can we help support? So one way that you can engage your group, your organization, is to create a skills advisory board. And the skills advisory board consists of learning and development, business line partners, external subject matter experts like GP strategies, and our customers. And the concept is simple. We meet on a reoccurring basis to have these discussions, to talk about current disruptors, what trends we see, how we're evolving, what challenges we have, using skills barometers, identifying those skills gaps so that we can proactively prepare for the future, working directly with our business partners. Now, we can't expect our employees to develop the skills that we identify as part of the gaps on their own. And this is where we need to architect and create opportunities for those skill development experiences. One approach could be offering stretch assignments. A stretch assignment is a project or a task that is just outside of their comfort zone. It's challenging, but not stressful. It's not pushing them to the point of burnout. It's not part of their merits. 
they aren't being judged on it. In many ways, it's an opportunity for our learners to try something new, to fail fast forward and learn from that experience in a safe environment. Some examples could be managing an intern or a volunteer, or maybe even establishing an intern or a volunteer program, leading a new meeting, a new project, or simply just learning a new skill. It's something that challenges them and helps push them. Again, it's a safe environment for them to learn, to grow, and develop. So another opportunity to architecting developmental skill is creating an infrastructure that houses stretch assignments or houses skill sharing opportunities and provides visibility into where these skills exist throughout the organization, like a digital skills exchange platform. So that platform could be simply on a SharePoint site. It could be a social network. It could be an intranet page. An example of this platform in practice is the Intel Development Opportunity Tool, otherwise known as the DOT. This is an internal platform that Intel has created and uses that every employee in the organization has access to. It's a platform where managers can post short-term development opportunities that anyone can access, and it creates two-way skill visibility between managers and employees. It offers best fit development by giving you the opportunity to learn skills in new places that help to meet specific developmental needs. It also makes the benefit more clear to the manager by illustrating the skills that the team is going to expand on as part of that experience so that the manager can confirm this is the skill that's needed in that organization, in their group. It also allows managers to identify non-traditional candidates to consider for their initiatives that you may not have otherwise known existed or had access to within the organization. So a development opportunity tool. Now, we may not always have the skills inside our organization that we need. The usual response is to hire a new resource with that skill set. But what if we flip that? What if instead of just going out and hiring somebody to bring those skills in, what if we created external developmental opportunities for our current talent to gain those new skills while they're still working for our organization, giving them the opportunity to go outside the organization, learn the skills, and then bring them back? Like allowing our employees to participate in an internship program somewhere else or working with a trade organization or a school. Or you could consider creating an external development partnership like Procter & Gamble did with Google. And what they did was they created a digital marketing talent exchange program. It was a month-long job swap between employees to give them the opportunity to upskill in a different environment for a month and then bring those skills back into their organization. And both organizations repeated or re reported rather that this was a successful initiative for both groups. So the idea is simple. Whether it's through st strategies like stretch assignments, digital skills platform tools, or external partnerships, we want to be creating opportunities for our employees to practice second skilling. And second skilling is the ability to develop new skills while they're in their current jobs. We don't wanna wait until they're made redundant, on the path to redundancy, or they're filled with fear about losing their job that they've shut down and they're no longer open to the idea of even learning and growing and developing. We want to be creating these opportunities for our workforce today while they're still working. Now, to round off our connected learners, we need to help them build effective learning habits. You see, the concept of being a learner has shifted. No more is the concept, you go to school, you learn a trade, you learn a profession, and then you do it for the rest of your career and retire. This does not exist anymore. Learn, do, and retire. In order to be agile and adaptable, we need to learn, apply it, unlearn, Relearn, apply, unlearn, 
And this continues through the rest of our career. This is the cycle of being a lifelong learner. As Toffler once said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. The modern career is like a nonstop conveyor belt. You've got to keep moving and learning no matter what stage of your career that you're in. Being content is a mindset that puts us at risk, puts our employees at risk, and taking into account how quickly our industries, our business, our technology is evolving and changing, this is how our employees get left behind. So we've got to instill the concept, the idea of being a lifelong learner which will help them be agile, adaptable, and ready to fill the next organizational gap, whatever it may be. The reality is we don't know what that is right now. We don't know what that gap is going to be, and so we can empower our workforce by giving them the skills to be agile and adaptable so they can meet that need. We need to also include context for our learners. Context shapes the learning experience, and it helps our learners construct meaning based on their own experiences, and it brings learning closer to their real-world work environment, which helps drive performance support. Context creates relevancy, it creates meaning, and it helps drive performance support. We need to also help our talent recognize the need and importance for practicing reflection. By reinforcing the idea that learning is more about engagement and discussion than just provision and consumption of content. It's more about engagement and discussion, being able to reflect on it. And so we, HR, L&D, we need to take responsibility and to be building in opportunities for our employees to have reflection exercises so that they can apply the learning in their context, giving them the opportunity to build those behaviors based off of what they've learned, building behaviors, building habits in their work environment. Learning doesn't stop once you leave the classroom. Once that experience ends, it needs to be a continuous activity. Identifying skills, both current and future, developing our talent to close the skill gap, all while teaching them how to build effective learning habits. By creating connected learners, we can help the 30 or 90 million workers who may be at risk, who aren't aware of the valuable transferable skills they already possess, who aren't aware of the possibilities of what they can be, we can give them the opportunity to build experiences and new skills so they do not have to continue to live in fear about their future. No one should be living in fear about the future of their job. Today, our call to action is to evolve from being learning providers to being learning enablers so that we can help our employees help themselves. The reality is there is work for people today and there will be work for people tomorrow, even in a future with automation. So we have to change the narrative and help our workforce be prepared so they are not living in fear. And as Malcolm X once said, tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. We start today. This won't be easy. It does not happen overnight. The conversation is just starting here. We're just hitting the tip of the iceberg with the strategies that we've been talking about, and it's going to be a change. It's going to be a big change. And that's why Erica Teshuan is going to share insights and strategies with you so that you can help your organization 
prepare for these changes. Erica, over to you. Thank you so much. Great presentation. I actually want to start today by taking us back to this statistic that Keith showed us early in his presentation. You know, that an estimated 40% of our workforce is worried about the future of their jobs as a result of automation and robotics. So when we are afraid, we are not our most intelligent selves. But luckily, evolution helps us out when we are in a state of fear by giving us only three behavioral choices. So when we are afraid, we either freeze, we flee, or we fight. So how does this fear show up in our organizational lives? Well, when people freeze, they do nothing at all. They ignore the reality around them and they continue to do what they've always done, even if it's out of pace and at odds with the organization. They don't opt into anything new, they stay the course. When people are in flight mode, they leave the organization for an organization they feel is more stable for them. Oftentimes, they spend their days in their current organization at work finding new opportunities versus contributing to their current organization. And when they fight, they actively resist trying to tear down the changes happening around them, preserving the status quo. These actions thwart organizational progress. They slow change. So getting employees in the right frame of mind is truly the first step. We cannot prepare our workforce for the future if our workforce is in fear. So Keith has presented this model for L&D to be a partner in preparing our organizations for the future. We need to help every individual identify their transferable skills. We need to help them develop, especially in the arena of higher order cognitive skills. And we need to help them build successful learning habits so that just something they do without even thinking about it. But I ask you, how do I sit down and identify my skills knowing I need to augment or refine them and think through a development plan and begin to build better habits around learning if I'm frozen or fleeing the organization or fighting the change? The answer is I don't. I can't engage L&D in their service offerings if I'm afraid. I have to be ready to take those services. I have to want to. I have to understand why I need to do that for my own career success as well as the success of my organization. So what do we do now? Well, we add change management. So what exactly do I mean by that? And what exactly do I mean by change management? Well, in a traditional sense, change management is the art and science of adoption. It's the process we use to get ourselves or others to change their thinking and their behavior to get different results. Change management is critical to include in anything we do that is new to help people along the journey. In fact, initiatives that apply excellent change management are six times more likely to meet their objectives than projects that do a poor job with change management. For today, I'd like us to think about change management on two levels, macro and micro. On the macro level, Preparing your workforce for the future must include building organizational capability for change. Change hardiness or change resilience must be a part of the fabric of the organization. It must be a part of the organizational culture. If you hear employees saying, we do change well around here, then your organization is well on its way to being prepared for the future. The best way to build an organizational culture that thrives through change is ensuring each individual in the organization knows how to lead themselves through change. The goal is for employees to think of themselves as change mavens. Now on the micro level, learning and development must have a formal change management strategy and plan to support its efforts in preparing the workforce of the future. L&D must have a plan to ensure leaders throughout the organization are engaging with the workforce of the future efforts, Organizational leaders must be a partner in the design of the workforce of the future programs, and there must be a strategy and tactical plan to drive adoption of the workforce of the future efforts. 
So let's dig deeper into the macro level of change management, growing organizational capability of change and weaving change resilience into the organizational culture. Keith talked about focusing on higher order cognitive skills as a key aspect of the future of work. I believe self-leadership through change is the primary higher order cognitive, cognitive skill required. To best prepare your organization for the future, you need an organization of change mavens, people who know how to lead themselves through change. Tim Creasy, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at ProSci, has recently said, those who can outchange their competition are the ones who will survive. So let's unpack that a little bit. It's not just about being able to thrive through the change that's imposed upon you. It's about being the one who can outchange. That means we are in a continuous cycle of innovation and change. Change is something we just do. Change is our behavior. It's our ritual. It's our habit. The individual contributors who will have the best careers willingly create change and thrive as the change they create changes around them. The greatest leaders create cultures of innovation and change, and they know how to lead individuals on a change journey, quickly converting resistors to adopters. The leaders and individual contributors who can lead themselves and others through change are those best positions to help themselves and their organizations achieve business results. As such, I believe that change management is the competitive advantage for the 21st century. Those that can lead themselves through change don't have to be afraid because they can have confidence in their ability to adapt to changing conditions. Consider including the ability to lead through change as a fundamental aspect of your workforce of the future program. So do you remember when I said, if you hear employees saying, hey, we do change really well here, that you know your organization is on the right path to, to thrive into the future? That's a cultural cue that both the organization and individuals know how to successfully move through, the, through a change process. At GP Strategies, we recently conducted research surveying nearly 700 leaders across North America and Europe. And in that research, we uncover that there are two fundamental cultural traits of organizations where change is an embedded part of who they are. And those traits are growth and agile. So mindsets are such a critical factor for macro change because the way you think influences how you act. At the same time, your actions reinforce your thoughts. If people can bring different thoughts to their role, if they can shift their mindset, then they can impact their behaviors. So let's explore these two mindsets a little bit further. An organization with a growth mindset is foundational to building a culture of change resiliency. An organization that believes skills and behaviors can be developed, cultivated, and refined is better positioned to thrive now and into the future. So some behavioral indicators that point to an organization with a growth mindset include a proactivity to taking on challenges, feelings of empowerment, increased risk-taking, and innovative thinking. Agile is the second mindset that our research showed is critical to creating a culture of change resilience. Agile organization is one that nourishes flexibility, adaptation, innovation, and resilience. With this mindset, we fail fast and achieve success by being nimble in the way we think and act. Our research showed that the most important capabilities of an agile employee are the ability to adapt to workplace dynamics and obstacles and rebound from challenges. In fact, 31% of respondents identified adapting to workplace dynamics as the top skill of agility, followed by 28% who cited the ability to bounce back from challenges as a critical capability. For the agile organization, it's the ability to overcome obstacles and bounce back from challenges that is most prized. Agile organizations enough to, adju to adjust or adapt their plan based on new information or new conditions. Much like the growth-oriented organization, they don't feel failure, they see it as a part of their process. So agile organizations support empowered and autonomous teams. They have this, we got this mentality. We can do it. There's no fear in moving forward. And as such, they take incremental action. 
So teams decide that doing something is better than sitting and waiting for perfection, which results in no movement at all. And again, agile organizations view change as something that is an expected likely outcome. We're not surprised by it. We're not unnerved by it. There's when there's change, we say there's change and we're expecting it and we're not going, oh my gosh, what do I do with this change? So what is L&D's role in helping to introduce these mindsets into the culture or nurture them if they already exist in your organization? Well, include these mindsets on your list of higher order cognitive skills to tackle in your workforce or the future program. Building those strengths in each individual. Both of these mindsets are foundational to an organization of lifelong learners. In addition to mindsets, there's a very tactical way for organizations to build a culture of change resilience, and that's to have a standard, agreed upon method to lead through change, a method that's a part of your organizational lexicon. So committing to models, methods, and frameworks to approaching change is an incredibly effective way to build not only knowledge and skill on how to manage and lead through change, but also build an organizational habit of how to change. At GP Strategies, we use our R2P2 model. This is our individual model for change. We use this model directly and overtly to drive organizational change. And at the same time, we build ability in every employee to lead themselves through change as they use it for self-leadership. As we use this model over and over, it becomes habit. It becomes instinct. This model states that whenever we're going through a change, people need the following four things. They need a reason to change. They need a role in the change. They need a path to be successful within the change, and they need partnership to make the change lasting. As a leader leading your team through change, it's critical that they understand the reason for change, including business drivers for the change. What is the change? Why is the business changing? Why now? And what happens if the business doesn't change? And what exactly is changing? Leaders need to answer these questions on an individual basis and on a localized employee basis as well. Leaders need to help define employees' role for the change, both how the employee needs to help make the organization successful during a change, but also identify how the employee's current job might be changing as a result. The leaders need to help their employees also have a successful path to change, which means giving them the knowledge, skills, and ability in the new way, but also clearing any obstacles to change. The path must be clear. Leaders also need to serve as partners in the change, providing coaching, practice, reinforcement, and accountability. Leaders also need to know that a single partner isn't enough. We are socially connected beings, and we need many partners inside and outside the organization to help. But also, individuals need to know how to lead themselves through change. And when confronted with change, and perhaps even fear, the ability to take a deep breath and walk oneself through this model is the first step to calming the threat pinpointing what you need to move forward and helping yourself thrive through change. In summary, building an organizational culture that has the right mindsets around change and knows how to change is the first step to preparing your organization for the future. Now let's talk about change on a micro level. I'm thinking specifically about change management in support of your workforce of the future initiative specifically. We often spend our time on the technical solution of what we're doing. So for example, designing learning interventions, curating content, and determining which skills need to be developed in our organization to help our organization prepare for the future. But what we don't often think about is getting the workforce ready for the change. We don't often prepare them for the totality of what we need them to do. What happens before and after the learning journey is just as important as what happens during. This is what we often see in organizations. We design something, we cross our fingers super tight. Sometimes we even cross our toes too, and who knows what we're going to get. When we don't make a plan to bring people along the journey, it translates into lower than needed ROI, workarounds, organizational resistance, and can lead to a culture of poorly adopted change, which then negatively influences your ability to be successful with the next change. A great strategy and technical plan must be complemented by a change management plan to achieve realization of business results. So this is what we believe translates into success. Great plans, solutions, and designs to prepare your organization for the future, plus a strategy to ensure people adopt great plans, solutions, and designs. We need plans to ensure people will actually do something new and different with the things we install, like new initiatives and learning interventions to prepare our workforce for the future. 
And here we are back to the R2P2 model. So very specifically, your workforce of the future program, L&D should work with the business to define each element of this model. So we'll start with the reason. We need the reason the business is embarking on a workforce of the future program. Identify what a workforce of the future program is, why the organization is taking it on now, what would happen if the organization didn't, and what exactly is going to change around here. Then answer those same, those same questions at an individual level too, so each employee knows what's in it for them. Then outline the role you need people to play in the workforce of the future program. Do this for various levels and stakeholders. What role do you need executives to play? What role do you need leaders of, of individuals to play? What role do you need individual contributors to play? And how is their role changing as a result? Next, outline the path to success. What knowledge, skills, and abilities are required for the future of work in your organization? And what obstacles are in the way to success that need to be cleared? Are there cultural, structural, or budgetary obstacles? Whatever they are, clear them. Next, establish partnership at all levels, internal and external partnerships at the organizational level, social networks at the individual level, set up social networks to reinforce what you are doing. So let's talk very specifically about L&D and what it needs to give to the organization to make a workforce of the future program successful and what it needs to get in return. So in having a reason, L&D needs to help the business with its case for changing by providing workforce of the future trends and outlining the risks of not changing. The business needs to support L&D in that effort by being a partner in defining what the workforce of the future of the pro what the workforce of the future means to the organization and driving a sense of urgency and serving as engaged sponsors. In having a role L&D needs to define for the organization what it means to be a lifelong learner and not just provide traditional training opportunities, but also developing new mindsets, behaviors, habits, and rituals that the organization needs for the future. And in order to do that, the business needs to ensure they legitimize L&D in this role, and organizational ex executives need to quickly be participants and adopters of the changes that L&D are instituting. In clearing the path for employees to engage with your workforce of the future, Keith explained L&D's role already. We need to create connected learners by identifying skills, developing talent, and building excellent learning habits. But in order to accomplish the clear path, the business needs to provide L&D with the budget, resources, authority, clarity, commitment, and L&D themselves needs their own set of development opportunities so they can stay leading edge. And having a partner, L&D serves as a primary organizational partner on this journey. They're at the forefront. L&D helps create the mechanisms and the culture allowing the organizational members to learn, practice, and be coached inside and outside the organization. L&D also needs to create additional organizational partners by ensuring leaders of leaders and leaders of individuals are helping to build future skills in others. L&D can't do this alone. So of course, L&D needs its fair share of partners too. It needs an engaged leadership team that models the right mindsets and behaviors, and it needs to partner externally to stay on top of trends and what industry disruptors are doing. So what happens if you're using this model and you're not getting the results that you need? You can use R2P2 to diagnose where you might need to focus, refocus, or get help so you can help your organization achieve business results. So in a reason, make sure you're answering what's changing, why it's changing, why it's changing now, and what's the risk of not changing. Make sure individuals know this on a strategic and business level and on a personal level. Adults do not make change unless they have a reason to. And in the role, make sure that everybody in the organization knows both their accountability to the evolution of the organization and their new role in the organization as a result of that evolution. In the path, make sure opportunities exist inside and outside the organization for employees to gain the skills they need to stay relevant and successful in the organization. If barriers to learning and gaining new skills exist, L&D needs to champion and partner in removing those barriers. And with partnership, ensure that employees are introduced to social networks and partners inside and outside the organization for skills development. This might include the creation of new communities of practice as well as learning opportunities. So my call to action today includes three main topics. 
Help drive an agile and growth culture in your organization or nurture those elements if they're already present. Having a culture of change helps tremendously in the velocity and proficiency in which your organization can achieve change. Lead change well. Leading your Workforce of the Future program with excellence is so critical. If your program isn't well received from the start, it'll be a long road to overcome it. A reputation for leading change well is critical to adoption of your effort. And finally, lead through resistance. Resistance is normal and it's natural and it's to be expected, so lean into it and learn from it, but help resistors become adopters. Knowing how to successfully lead through resistance is a cornerstone to leading change well. If you don't manage the resistance, your change effort will be a failure. So in closing today, I'm going to bring us back to Malcolm X, who again once said, tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today. This is our opportunity to start today and take charge of the conversation within our workforce and reduce their fear by helping them prepare. Well, thank you, Keith and Erica, for that great discussion. Um, as a reminder, those of you who stayed on, yes, and the, first of all, thank you. I know we went a little bit over today um, with that disruption earlier, but thank you for hanging on. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and enter it into the Q&A module. We may not get to all of them just because I want to be respectful of time, um, but we'll try to get to get through a few of them. Obviously, and there was a lot that was covered during today's session and there's still more to discuss. So I encourage you to continue the conversation with our presenters beyond today's session. Their contact information is available in today's slide deck. We'll be sending um, everyone a link to uh, a PDF of the slides as well as today's recording. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into some of these questions. Um, Keith and Erica, just be mindful um, that we only have a couple of minutes and several questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, any that we don't get to, what I might do is put together, we'll put together a blog post where we address some of these. So the first question is, do you have any examples of successful implementation or execution of strategies for preparing uh, the workforce of the future? Uh, sure, I'll jump in and take that. This is Keith, obviously. Uh, one quick note, please uh, do add me on LinkedIn. I'm very active there and would love to continue this conversation with all of you in that space. So the answer is yes, there's a number of examples out there. So um, first of all, GP does this. <laughs> we have been working, uh, examples, we recently launched a major future skills initiative with United Overseas Bank, UOB. It's the largest bank in Asia. Um, and it's focusing on growth mindset, complex problem solving skills, human centered design. But outside of us, uh, there's a number of examples. Um, Singapore, for example, their government has set up a lifelong learning endowment fund for Singaporeans, which is a great example of how I think government does play a part in this success. Um, UNESCO has created lifelong learning cities. And I think it's such a great effort that they're creating this network of cities that are embedding the concept of lifelong learning into the local community so definitely check that out just google unesco lifelong learning cities uh, at&t has had a great program for a few years amazon has recently launched one so we're starting to see this trend um, i think as far as do we have any concrete data yet no not yet i think we're at that early stage where uh, companies are recognizing this, they're starting to launch it, but I think that we've got a, a long way to go um, in, from the industry. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take two more. So Eric, I'm gonna throw this one to you. You talked quite a bit about leadership. Um, what do I do when I'm not getting leadership support, the leadership support I need in the business for my Workforce of the Future program? Oh my God, I love that question. I'm so glad somebody asked it because truly in anything we do in the workplace, we can only be as successful as our strongest sponsors. So we wanna make sure that if we can't get leaders on board, that we have a plan to get them on board. And so I would go to back to our program um, executive sponsors and the ones that are, are really accountable for driving workforce of the future in your organization and ask them to have conversations with leaders that you don't see taking um, the change and you don't see participating in the program. So look at their peer level for, for those who are really champions of the change and ask them to have conversation with the leaders that you might be struggling with. 
Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one more. Um, what learning opportunities would you recommend to foster an agile mindset? I'll let you guys kind of debate who wants to answer that one. Oh my gosh, so many, Keith. Do you want me to go first or do you want no. me to yeah, take Yeah, go ahead. We, that, that could be a whole hour in itself. <laughs> no, that's one of the that's one of the best questions ever. So this is really about agile is really about practice and habit. So, you know, agile mindset is really about this sentiment of trying and failing fast and failing being okay. So this is really just what are the small little increments of work that you can take on? And if they're successful, great. If they're not, celebrate the failure, quickly learn from that and take on a small, another small incremental um, project. So, you know, really about this ability to take something on, start without little direction, gain momentum, be successful or fail, but in that failure, bounce right back and keep going. So I would try to find something small um, to practice that habit and that ability with. Well, thank you. I'm, I thank you everyone for staying on for your time and attention. Um, we are about a minute past the hour, so I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. Um, thank you again to today's speaker and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we hope that you'll join us again for our upcoming sessions. Just quickly, our future sessions include top learning trends for 2020 and design thinking that will round out January. Registration for these sessions is available at gpstrategies.com under webinars. I, sorry for the abrupt um, ending, but I do wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.